Hi, I'm Katie Spica. I'm the CEO of Spica Design and Manufacturing. I want to welcome you to today's event, Lessons for the Mass Transit Industry from the ZET BTA Study on Zero Emission Buses. Our guests author this study on the various transit bus technologies that AC Transit operates, and they're here to share lessons learned and best practices in deploying zero emission bus technologies. Our first speaker is Chris Peoples. Chris is an elected at-large board member of the Alameda Contra, Contra Costa Transit District. He'll tell you a little bit about the AC about AC Transit. Chris has served on the AC Transit Board for 23 years, having been elected seven times. He is the lead director on AC's Hydrogen Fuel Cell Electric Bus Program, which has recently been expanded to a zero emission bus program by the addition of battery electric buses. Chris is a retired lawyer who grew up in San Francisco and moved across the Bay to Oakland 46 years ago. He tried to get a job in Montana where Spica is headquartered as a choker setter when he was a teenager, but that did not work out. So he went to work as a brewer. <laughs> Our second speaker is doc Dr. Jimmy Chen. Jimmy is the managing director of the Stanford Energy Corporate Affiliates at Stanford University, co-managing director of the Stanford Hydrogen Focus Group, and a co-instructor of a graduate seminar class on the hydrogen economy. He's responsible for developing and managing engagements for corporations and other organizations that have an interest in Stanford's research, faculty and graduate students in energy and energy related areas. He has a broad background in energy and technology, specializing in technology and product development. He has held technical positions at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, GTE Labs, and AT&T Bell Labs, and technology executive positions at both startups and Fortune 500 companies, including Form Factor and Eaton. He has received his PhD degree from MIT and his MS degree from UC Berkeley, both in material science and engineering, and his BS degree from UC Berkeley in electrical engineering. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Becky Spica, the vice president at Spica, is also joining us in this conversation. And I'm going to start by handing it over to Chris to tell us more about the program at AC Transit. Thank you, Katie. Um, as Katie told, told you, I'm a director of the Alameda Contra Costa Transit District. AC Transit is a California special district that provides bus service on the east side of the San Francisco Bay. Um, Alameda and Contra Costa are the two counties on the other side of the bay from San Francisco. And AC provides bus service on the western halves of those counties. We serve about 1.5 million people in about 364 square miles. Uh, we do that with about a $600 million a year budget and about 2,200 employees. Um, we do it with about 637 buses of which um, 14 are, are ZEBs. So we have been operating hydrogen fuel cell buses for about 20 years. We have a long history of doing experimental work to try to clean up the air. Back in the 1970s, we actually run a, ran a steam bus, external combustion instead of internal combustion. Didn't work very well. And in the 90s, we ran a battery bus that had a little uh, two-lobe wankle engine as a, as a uh, range extender. Um, that also didn't work very well. But we started with the hydrogen fuel cells in 1999, uh, got our first bus in 03, then got, got a three bus fleet and increased it to 12. In 2018, the state of California enacted a rule that said that every transit agency could only buy zero emission buses after 2028 and had to be 100% zero emission by 2040. Um, that's led to a whole lot of interest and discussion on how to do zero emission. Um, and since we had so much experience in it, we bought some battery electric buses and we're buying some more and we're running a side-by-side -side comparison. And so Dr. Chen will talk a little bit about the comparison. We brought him and Stanford in along with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy unit in Golden, Colorado, um, to oversee this test 
and to sort of do the analysis and all the academic work. So I think Dr. Chen can tell us a little bit about what he's doing with us and, and for us. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Becky, for uh, inviting, uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction into Stanford and Stanford Energy, and then we'll go into the study. Um, and along the way, we'll cover a little bit about what is a zero emission, um, what does that mean for vehicles, and uh, talk about both battery electric and hydrogen. Okay. So a couple of fun facts. Uh, Stanford University has seven schools. We're fortunate enough to have everything from a business school to a law school, a medical school, and of course the School of Engineering, about 2,000 faculty members, and about 16,000 students. Um, the other thing that's on the bottom there is really we have a lot of interdisciplinary laboratories and centers, and Stanford Energy is one of those. So um, we have faculty, we're fortunate to have faculty from all seven schools, and we have over a thousand researchers in the energy space. So we do everything from research on policies to business models to of course tech technology. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar or intimately involved with this, uh, we're currently in the midst of a global energy transformation. This is happening around the world and it's um, happening to everybody. And the main message I want to leave you with is that this global energy transformation will touch all of us and in every part of our lives. Okay, so one of the areas that this will touch is transportation. And <clears throat> so if you imagine on the left, you have sustainable generation with wind and solar. So you can imagine that this electricity which is generated can go right into a car, a light duty vehicle, and it can drive. So we like to think of it as, how cool is that? You can mm -hmm. drive on sunshine. <laughs> the other thing you can do is take this electricity and put in an electrolyzer. So an electrolyzer is a device that will take water, you add electricity, and you form hydrogen and oxygen. So you might ask yourself, why would you want to do that? Uh, before I cover that, in the vehicle, you put in hydrogen and air, oxygen, and you can form electricity and you can form water. So your only output, your only exhaust is water. And that, again, is really cool. <laughs> um, so let me cue up the video, which explains a little bit about the fuel cell. Have you guys ever had a chance to drive in a zero emission vehicle? Katie or Becky? No. Maybe Chris can like give you a, uh, um, a, an experience. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Great. Well, if, you ever come, if you ever come to the Bay Area, we will make sure that you get a ride in a zero emission bus. Uh, one great. of the things that we did with one of our hydrogen fuel cell buses a few years ago is the American Public Transportation Association was having a conference in Reno, and we drove from Oakland to Reno over the Donner Pass in a hydrogen fuel cell block bus. That really blew everybody away.
that gives you a very uh, brief introduction to how a fuel cell works. Uh, the main takeaway is that you can actually take a gas, hydrogen, and you can actually combine it with oxygen and form electricity uh, and um, water. So your only exhaust is water. And then you can create the electricity and then you can drive your car or whatever you want to do with it. You can power your house, you know, et cetera. So that's one of the you know, fuel cells that are less well known and less familiar to a number of people. And hopefully that gives you a flavor of what a fuel cell does. Why are they less, less well known? Um, well, I think that um, like everyone's worked with the battery. If you have a cell phone, you're familiar with batteries. You got to plug it in, et cetera. Not so much with fuel cells. Uh, fuel cells is not widely you know, available. People are not very familiar with that. Um, people are, you know, it's, it's relatively new. I mean, the first fuel cells were actually um, relatively recent in terms of the, the, the history of things. And it's very not, not very widely distributed. So you wouldn't have one sitting in your home, but okay. you have a lot of batteries sitting in your home. Do you, how do you see this technology then um, moving it more fully into society, into um, everyday life? Um, I see it as, a, um, as something that will very likely happen uh, because if you want to um, run your home, so here in California, uh, we have electricity and that's already present. And then we have a lot of uh, fossil fuels, natural gas being a very common one. Uh, if you want to um, try to reduce fossil fuels and you need really for, re for redundancy and resilience, you want something that's also able to be transported. And if you have fossil fuels and you get rid of the fossil fuels, then you're only left with electricity. If something happens to electricity, uh, it could be really painful. Like if we have in California, a safety shutdown by PG&E, then you're essentially without power. And if you were interested in look, uh, these are referred to as Eno farms in Japan, where they actually have um, <clears throat> they actually have these units inside a residential home. They're about the size of a refrigerator, but basically, if there's power shutdown, you can actually have hydrogen. Hydrogen can then be stored, and then you can get electricity. So this is something which is becoming more dominant and looking at different ways of carrying energy as you know, we undergo this global energy transformation. You need a way to store it. And mm -hmm. is one way uh, that a lot of people are looking at to store energy. Great question. AC Transit, we get our hydrogen delivered in liquid form. Now liquid hydrogen is very cold. It's about 25 degrees Kelvin, which is, I don't know, 300 and something degrees negative Fahrenheit. Oh, wow. But the, there is the technology, basically truck-sized thermos bottles to deliver that around. But what that means is you can treat it just like you would diesel or gasoline. You have to have a supply a chain of it. You have to have contracts to have it supplied, but it, it can be supplied from anywhere. Um, during the uh, Winter Olympics up in Canada, for political reasons, they wanted their hydrogen to come from uh, Ontario hydropower. So it was trucked all the way across the country. It's a little silly, but it shows that it can be done. Right. So if you have a public safety power shut off and you have to get your uh, hydrogen from a new plant that they're building in Las Vegas, Nevada, no problem. You just truck it up. Got it. Yeah. And hydropower uh, is, a, is a green energy storage medium. So now it's a demonstration of, uh, you know, I, I, I see this a lot where people are gonna demonstrate a completely, a complete supply chain using renewable processes. And so uh, if you're able to uh, generate with uh, hydropower or generate with just electricity straight and water, uh, that's a very sustainable way to generate hydrogen. Mm. I mean, one of the other things about trying to do renewable energy is many renewable sources, such as solar or wind, are intermittent. So with solar power, we overproduce energy during the middle of the day, and we underproduce in the early evening when everybody comes home and turns on the washing machine and the dishwasher and everything else. Well, when you overproduce in the middle of the day, you can use that electricity to produce hydrogen 
you can then take that hydrogen, run it through a fuel cell or a turbine, but generally a fuel cell, and produce energy when you need it. Um, in Germany, where most of their um, renewable energy comes from wind, they need to store energy for long periods of time because they have lots of energy in the fall and early winter, and they need it in the depth of the winter. Mm -hmm. Well, what they're doing is they're producing hydrogen in, in the fall and early winter, storing it in old salt mines, in salt domes, mm, cool. and, and using it during the depth of the winter for heating and, and other electrical purposes. Um, the LA Water and Power has a project where they're working in Utah, right near you guys, right. um, and they're using an a salt dome, an old salt mine, to store the hydrogen um, and be able to use it when they need it. So it's it's a very interesting fuel. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Is it? It feels like a silly question, but why the salt mines? Uh, yeah, so it's a uh, it's relatively uh, straightforward to create a cavern. You just put water there, dissolve the salt, and then you carry uh -huh. it away. Uh, it's also very stable. Uh, hydrogen can react with a lot of materials. Uh, salt mines is one of the ways where it, it's secure, it's stable, and it won't react. And so uh, Utah happens to have a number of those salt mines. And the, the Intermountain Project is a fantastic example of that, is that you're able to store it for seasonal, and you're able to convert it to electricity, and then uh, carry the electricity to LA. Uh, and uh, it's it's a it's a fantastic project that ought to be very exciting to see because it'll be done at scale. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so I want to just come back to some very important point here, which uh, is well, if you can take the electricity, you can generate it, you know, um, sustainably, and you know, why convert it into hydrogen and fuel cells? Why not just put it right into cars, you know, automatically and have an electric vehicle? Um, so the main takeaways is that um, batteries are heavy, they're expensive, and you can't store a lot of energy in them. So this is the source of the you know, range anxiety that people uh, are talking about when they talk about electric vehicles. So hydrogen is one way to address that because you can store potentially a lot more hydrogen, and therefore you can get a lot more mileage, and it's very good for very heavy vehicles like buses or trucks or, or ships. So um, if you go to the next slide. So, you know, um, I've heard it mentioned that hydrogen is like the new diesel. Okay, there are hydrogen vehicles now for light duty, which is on the left, uh, buses, trains, trucks, ships, and they're even exploring it in planes right now. And that's because you can carry more energy, it's light, and it addresses this heavy duty kind of an application. Not to mention that if you're going to charge a car, you know, like AC Transit's charging of a bus will take many hours, right? Whereas if they use hydrogen, it's like less than 10 minutes, I believe, Chris. So they can, so that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And fuel, fueling a 40 foot bus takes six minutes, which is exactly the same amount of time that it takes to fuel a bus with diesel. So our procedures don't change very much. Right. <laughs> this that's, is uh, the mind. Right, that's with hydrogen. You know, rather than having the bus sit there for you know, many hours while it's charging the mm -hmm. batteries. Wow. So if you now ask yourself, well, how does it perform? How does a hydrogen heavy duty um, vehicle perform? Um, we'll queue up a video here, which is uh, a drag race between a hydrogen truck and a regular diesel truck. And it'll give you an idea of the performance of a heavy duty hydrogen vehicle. This was uh, made available to us by our friends at Toyota. That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, this is a very exciting uh, 
very exciting time in, uh, in energy and in transportation. And uh, it's a unique time where we're actually able to you know, bring on a whole generation of vehicles that runs completely different uh, and has a kind of performance which is actually uh, very hard to imagine. And the vehicles that we're creating right now are really just the beginning because uh, they're the, the ability to use this fuel and the kind of acceleration and performance you can get, uh, especially torque, uh, is just unbelievable. And so you're going to start seeing vehicles, I would imagine, 20 years are going to look completely different um, than what we're How seeing. So? Well, um, the torque that you can get from hydrogen is, is much, much greater than you can from, from diesel. And so you can imagine if you wanted to tow something, you can have a much smaller, in principle, a powertrain to have the same amount of torque. And so we're just experimenting with that right now. And uh, um, you're going to start seeing people uh, playing around with different kinds of designs to see what kind of performance they, get, they can get in optimizing that. Um, we've been optimizing gasoline and diesel, you know, diesel is probably 80 years, gasoline maybe close to 100 years. And yeah, we've kind of hit a threshold. You're not going to get that much more efficiency. We've just started down that path with electric vehicles and hydrogen. And uh, the optimization is just beginning. Uh, and you can easily see that um, because every generation of these vehicles that comes out, it's like, wow, you know, these are not like 5%, 10%. These are like 25%, 30% kind of improvements. So, um, so it's going to be a very exciting time. <laughs> I'm just there kidding. also have been great reductions in price yeah. um, as, as this technology moves fairly quickly. Our first um, fuel cell buses, and actually you could probably run the slide that, that shows our historical buses, but our first fuel cell buses were $3.2 million each. Mm. Ones we are currently running are 1.2 million. So it's a, they're about a third less. And we're anticipating another 20 to 30% drop in price over the next year or so. Wow. Um, this is largely because the, the quantities go up. Those first buses were essentially hand-built. They were, there, there was a, a, a build of four of which we got three of them. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. tiny when, when you consider that there are about 100,000 diesel engines made in the United States every year for buses, trucks, everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And so as we as it begins to become more of an industrial process rather than than hand building, the the prices drop pretty dramatically. And the the Europeans at least believe that within a fairly short time, uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses are going to be cheaper than uh, diesel wow. buses. Um, wow. One of our diesel buses with an automatic transmission has about 20,000 moving parts. A hydrogen fuel cell bus in the drivetrain has six moving parts. So you can see that that's a potential for a, a, a pretty extreme drop in price. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's, I, I'm curious, the lead time for purchasing a new bus from the point of purchase to the point of delivery. What is that typically right now? About two years, um, okay. whether you're talking about a diesel bus or a, a zero emission bus, that, that just has to do, buses are fairly expensive. Diesel bus is about $600,000. So hmm. there are not spare diesel buses sitting around on a dealer's lot. They are all special ordered. Okay. And the bus manufacturers um, try to keep a fairly large book of business because they don't want to have their factory sitting idle. So you got to get into their build schedule. Mm -hmm. And so it, it takes 18 months to two years to mm -hmm. get a bus. That was the impression that I was under that it was, it was extended beyond what I had originally thought um, it would take to manufacture a bus. And I guess the question that's coming up for me now is with the what seems to be really um, quick development or uh, what were you saying, like 25% improvements with this hydrogen technology, how, is, how are the buses that are being manufactured today going to be able to keep up with that technology and um, 
development? It's tricky. Um, some of it is trying to anticipate the new technologies uh, or the improvements in technologies. Some of it is, um, to the extent it's in software, you can upgrade the software mm -hmm. fairly easily. Okay. Uh, you don't upgrade hardware very easily. And so that's just, that's a, a difficulty of running a transit district. Sure. That's a really good question, Becky, and that applies to any sort of uh, any sort of um, infrastructure or any sort of application where your a product is sitting there for decades. Uh, you know, how do you intercept that, that with uh, technology which is moving very quickly? Okay. And um, it's a, uh, I think it's it's one of the opportunities that we're wrestling with is you know how we do that uh, with this global energy transformation. I mean. If you build a new power plant and you're talking about that power plant being there for 30, 40 years or more or longer, and now you have a new way of generating power, uh, what are you going to do with that power plant? It's, it's, those are among the things that are, uh, I think, um, being looked at. How do we do that? How do we manage this global energy transformation? Um, yeah, um, under federal transit administration regulations, our buses have to last a minimum of 12 years. Uh, some of them last a, a little longer. Sometimes we've got a, our, our buses um, average about 14 years uh, because it takes a while to order new ones and you've always got to figure the financing. But that, that is a tricky problem. And that's why this transition, when I was talking about the transition that's mandated by the state of California, um, that regulation was enacted in 2018, and the final due date for everything is 2040. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of long-term thinking that goes on in this business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should mention that that legislation starts taking effect already. This is one of the reasons for the study, which is to come up with a transition plan. And then starting, I believe in 2024, 25% of your new bus purchases actually have to be zero emission already. So that's not that far away. Um, and I think this is what's uh, creating a lot of interest in, in how do they compare, what do we need to do, how do they perform um, so that they can be ready for that. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's right around the corner. Yeah. I mean, AC Transit's been at this business longer than almost anybody in the country or even in the world. Um, so we had pretty substantial experience and we thought somebody needed to do a comparison as all these transit agencies, at least in California, but to a lesser extent around the country, um, who have no experience in it, are saying, well, what should we do? Right. You know, there, there are a lot of people out there actively pushing battery electric buses. And so a lot of people think that's the only way to go. Uh, we've got a lot of experience with the hydrogen fuel cell buses. Uh, which are, I, I should explain something. Hydrogen fuel cell electric buses are electric buses. Um, AC Transit was the one that started this way of looking at hydrogen fuel cell buses. But all of our buses are hybrids. They all have batteries and fuel cells. Mm -hmm. uh, the original fuel cell buses just had fuel cells hooked up directly to the, to the motors. And they learned that fuel cells don't like to be ramped up and down very quickly. And when you're driving a bus, that happens. You stop at a stoplight, you got to start up again, mm, et cetera, sure. et cetera. So we started with this idea of hybrids. Our original buses are what's called fuel cell dominant hybrids. Most of the power comes from the fuel cell. They had 120 kilowatt fuel cells and only 21 kilowatt hours of batteries. The new thinking, and this is true at AC Transit, but pretty much everywhere around the world, right. is to build battery dominant fuel cells. What they are, are they are newer buses, which come from a, a Canadian company called New Flyer, which is the biggest manufacturer of buses in North America, have an 80 kilowatt fuel cell and 110 kilowatt hours of batteries. So 
the fuel cell essentially acts to, to keep the batteries topped up and charged. And that we find works very, very well. Um, now our battery electric buses are also new flyers and they've got 440 kilowatt hours of batteries. The motors and the, and the drives and the inverters, all that are exactly the same between the two buses, battery electric and fuel cell electric. It's just a difference in how you, you generate the electricity to go into the batteries. The battery buses get plugged in at night, take four to six hours to, to charge up and get used during the day. Now with a, with a bus system that operates 24 seven and often has buses that work um, 18 to 20 hours a day, that doesn't work as a battery electric bus, mm -hmm. whereas it certainly does work as a fuel cell electric bus. Our fuel cell electric buses are one-to-one -one replacements for the diesel buses. For every diesel bus you had, you have one fuel cell bus. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true of battery electric buses. So what AC Transit sees in the future is pretty much always a mixed fleet of battery electric buses and fuel cell electric buses with fuel cells being somewhere between 30 and 50% of the fleet. Now, as things move along, and if the Europeans are right and fuel cells end up being cheaper than, than diesel buses, they'll probably also be cheaper than battery electric buses, in which case we may go all fuel cell. But this is a, a continuing process that we continue to look at and have people like Dr. Chin who help us look at it, have a, a very broad understanding of what's going on in the industry and what's going on in, in the world of zero emission. Yeah, you know, um, AC Transit uh, was, was clearly a leader in this type of analysis, which is why it was, it was so exciting for us to be working with them. Um, and um, I think, uh, was it you that Becky that asked the question, you know, what are you optimizing? What are you learning? You know, one of the things is the balance between, say, the fuel cell component versus the battery component. That's a very big design criteria, depending on your use. And um, if you don't need the extra power uh, and you can are primarily interested in the distance, then you might be more interested in the design parameter where you have more hydrogen base. You know, if you're if you're you know if you need to take an 18 wheeler and go up uh, a, a very large hill set or something, and you need that extra power, it's a different thing. But that's one of the big design things that are being looked at right now is the balance between a battery electric and a hydrogen electric. So, yeah, so if you wanted to do a really big towing, you'd probably put in you know, bigger batteries. But if you weren't, you know, you probably put in more fuel cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, the specification of the buses that we use. And as Chris was saying, um, there were five different types of buses diesel, diesel hybrid, uh, the new fuel cell, which is uh, battery dominant, uh, the battery electric, and then the legacy fuel cell, which is fuel cell dominant. And there are five buses of each flavor. It, what I'd like to bring your attention to is that as of the study, uh, the cost of the uh, zero emission buses was more expensive than a diesel, as you can see right there. Um, but they're, <clears throat> they're not, uh, the price drops have been very dramatic. And the buses are actually fewer moving parts, easier to build. You know, I think uh, it wouldn't be at all surprising to many people if by 2030 they're, you know, they're on par with the uh, current buses or in, even the light duty vehicles uh, that's happening. Um, and they actually will probably be easier to build. They'll take less time, less labor. Um, the big thing right now with wrapping that is the supply chain. You know, we have an optimized supply chain, the components, all those uh, other aspects of the, the cost. Um, but as those get ironed out uh, and scales scales up, you could probably see a pretty pretty good drop in those prices. Um, right, so the next slide. So this is a summary of the five by five study. Um, and I, I wanna point out in particular, one of the outputs is the cost per mile. And uh, if you take a look at the cost per mile, you know, here's your baseline, which is diesel. By the way, this was a fantastic organized study, Chris. I just wanna 
commend your team for that. You know, as someone from that comes from uh, academia, when I looked at this, I go, they have a control. They have the diesel. You know, how <laughs> often do you, do you include that? And what made this study so um, so exciting was not only did they have a control, but they had more than one bus of each. <laughs> you know, so now you have some uh, idea of variants. And on top of that, they had them on the same routes. So it was as close to an apples to apples and they had the same drivers. So now you can really do a side-by-side -side comparison, which is really what the industry is looking for, which is, you know, how do they compare? And how do, you know, and how do they compare for cost, performance, all those kinds of metrics? And Chris was right. When we were looking for uh, data on this, you know, we found a lot of one-off studies, you know, one bus or two buses. And, you know, there was very little reference or control. And the five by five study was so exciting to us because it was actually a side by side comparison, which allowed you to compare directly. And they you know, took an account already things like the route, the impact of routes and the impact of you know, different seasons and drivers and stuff. And so it really allows you to uh, look at the differences and then understand them and study them and see what other things contribute to that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway- and Dr. Chin was, was talking about seasons. And one amazing factoid is that when um, New York City Transit studied battery electric buses, one of, the, one of the issues with battery electric buses is they're more efficient, so they don't throw off any extra heat. Well, guess what? When you're, they, they had a cold snap back there, it was 20 below which I'm sure Montana people are quite used to. Right. Yep. And they discovered it took five times as much energy to heat the cabin of the bus as it did to drive the bus. And so that's something you got to worry about. Right. Um, fuel cells are slightly less efficient, but they do throw off some heat. And so when it gets, until you're down to um, about 20 degrees, you don't have to do any resistance heating of the cabin. So that's, you know, there's all sorts of little things you learn about this stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in this study, one of the main takeaways uh, is the cost per mile. Uh, and um, so if you take a look at your control, which is diesel, you know, it's, you know, a little bit less than a dollar per mile. And that includes both maintenance and fuel costs. And then you, you see that the other, uh, the other flavors are actually a little more. Um, it, it's important to keep in mind, certainly in the case of the battery electric, that California's PG&E rate price was like over 20 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's compared to, I believe in Montana, it's Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, which is about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So immediately you can see that there's a difference in retail that's gonna affect that. Mm -hmm. Plus this is really early. Uh, this, these vehicles are relatively early in the optimization and learning cycle. So, um, but it, it, for right now, what this is gives you is a flavor of the side-by-side -side comparison of operational, financial, uh, you know, other metrics that allows you as a muni to look at this and says, which one do I want to pick? And maybe is it, you know, is it a blend of the two kinds of buses? And if so, what, what kind of blend, you know, and, uh, it's a it's really a landmark study, which was why it was so exciting for us to work, and we'll continue to work with AC Transit on this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> the, because we just wrapped up the, or you just wrapped up the second stage of the study. Is that correct? Collected the data. Um, collecting the data, uh, they're now sort of uh, preparing the data for analysis, mm -hmm. and that will be very important because it'll give us uh, the other six months, which is a totally different uh, temperature. Uh, and, uh, and so we're already seeing some indications potentially of um, seasonal dependence in the okay. performance of these. In addition to that, I think it'd be very good. It, what we'd like to do is also take a deeper dive into looking at the fine aspects of like uh, transit routes, which are more hilly, transit routes, which are more congested, you know, and start to separate out instead of a, a global look, which was our first cut, but actually go into the, the details and this will be very helpful for people who have different kinds of conditions for their, their routes and uh, the potential impact of that, uh, mm -hmm. each of these flavors on the different routes. And so. For sure. Although compared to Montana, the San Francisco Bay Area does not have seasons. 
<laughs> no, no, no. We have to do work a lot harder to pour that signal out. I'm sure it'll be a lot easier to pour that signal out in Montana. <laughs> well, we say we have winter season and construction season. <laughs> and that's what we qualify it here. Um, was there anything that was surprising to you from this first pass of data? Um, surprising. Um, um, only in the sense that I never really had a metric of a baseline. So I would get a, you know, if I read another report from another place uh, and they give me the price, uh, I really wouldn't know uh, what that meant. Uh, I mean, you know, how does it compare to diesel? If they gave me the diesel or some sort of context for that, they were able to remove all the other things and I'd be like, okay, you know, okay. that's really the difference. Whereas with the AC transit study, I feel a lot more comfortable saying, wow, okay, this is where we are. This is where the baseline is. This is where we are. And I can even go to the details and says, okay, you know, it's 22 cents per kilowatt hour. Or if you took this bus and you were to run it in Montana, you know, uh, assuming the temperature and other things are similar, you know, you're going to be at 12 cents per kilowatt. Now you can start to form these kind of a, a comparisons and analysis uh, in different parts, which is what makes this study so interesting because you have that kind of context to be able to pull information out. And if you are starting to look in the, if we are able to unravel the impact of congestion versus say hills or other aspects of that or temperature, as we, as we start getting a handle on that, you can again extract that to different uh, localities and get an understanding. So if you were muni, then you can start saying, well, I can take this data and start to anticipate or extrapolate what it might look like where we run. And uh, so mm -hmm. that's the power of a study like this. Mm -hmm. Are you able to use any of the data so far to advise other um, agencies starting the transition? Uh, you know, I think so. My opinion is absolutely. You know, the study has been made public for a month, Chris. Is that right? Maybe six weeks? Yeah, about, about six weeks. Came out in early June. Okay. So I'm expecting there to be a lot more uh, inquiries and questions as we, uh, as people start um, becoming familiar with this and and looking at it and then thinking about their own applications. Huge amount of in interest in this study in the industry. A lot of people are asking us about it. A lot of people are are downloading it and, and asking questions. Yeah, I should just expand that. This is not just for buses. If you were a truck person and you wanted to start looking at uh, uh, extrapolating this to trucks and stuff and understanding the side-by-side -side comparisons, you know, this, this is what makes this study so exciting is that it's not, it's the, it's a first sort of side-by-side -side comparison and it can be extrapolated to a number of different conditions, uh, you know, and trucks being, uh, trucks being one of the areas which is, which is being looked at to decarbonize. I mean, the, the same California agency that is requiring buses to become zero emission is working on a rule that's going to require trucks in California to be zero emission. And that's a much more difficult prospect because buses are largely owned by government agencies and are government funded. So they can say, you do this or we cut off your funding. Trucks are independently owned, sometimes independently, sometimes by companies, but are privately owned. So it's, it's much trickier. And I think the, the data is being very useful to the, it's, it's called the California Air Resources Board. They're the people that make these regulations. And this is very useful data to them so they can say to the trucking industry, look, this isn't a crazy idea you actually can save some money on operations. Vehicles may be more expensive to begin with, but your total cost of ownership over the lifetime of the bus is less. See, we've got some data on that. Right. You um, addressed this to a certain extent already, but are there other unanswered questions you hope either um, the rest of this study as it continues or future studies should look at? You talked about, you know, what's it like in with hilly areas or with lots of congestion or the other questions you're hoping get answered over the next couple of months or years? Uh, yeah, I'd be very interested in understanding the impact of routes in terms of congestion or not congestion, uh, highway driving versus, uh, you know, where you're not you know, back to back. I'm also really interested um, 
to see if there's a change in these results because of COVID. Uh, these data was collected during a period where there was very limited um, uh, people taking public transportation. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I think is very um, unclear at this point is uh, would this apply to a case you know, prior where there was no COVID? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but I think um, what the great thing about working with a company like AC Trans is we're going to be able to actually get answers to those questions, and they'll be definitive, you know. And then, uh, you know, people will um, be able to look at that and then be able to understand, you know, how this might be uh, how this might be rolled out in their immunity, you know, across the world. Actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, people are asking this question as they as they decarbonize heavy duty transportation, which is, you know, what do we want to put in and what flavor of each and how many and what are the performance that we can expect. I mean, one of the interesting things for your audience is the extent to which that it takes training to be able to use these new, new technologies. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 400 and something great diesel mechanics. You cut them and they bleed diesel. They, they, they know diesel inside and out. And we're training all of them to deal with heavy duty electric and with hydrogen fuel cells. And that's, a, that's an interesting process and a pretty exciting process. We're, we at AC Transit are developing a zero emission university where we're using virtual training and all kinds of, of new techniques both to train our old people, our own people, but we intend to make that available to transit agencies around the country. Mm -hmm. And to, to be able to, to look at a, a fuel cell power plant and be able to take it apart with augmented reality, where you put on goggles that let you, you know, see something in the virtual world and go in there and see see how you work on these things. You know, I'm sure a lot of your um, a lot of your viewers here are shade tree mechanics, and they can adjust valves and they can uh, change spark plugs and and they can uh, make fuel injection work. Or, I mean, I'm old enough that all of my cars have had carburetors, mostly SU carburetors, which have their own quirks in terms of being able to adjust. And I'm really good at it, but um, it, it, the skills that it takes to operate one of these vehicles or to maintain one of these vehicles are different, but it takes the same ability to visualize something mechanical to be able to to figure out what things plug into where and what you need to adjust when you do various things. And that's, that's something that um, the world is gonna have to adjust to. And there's gonna have to be a lot of technical schools and a lot of places where um, folks who are coming out of high school get trained in this stuff so that they can, um, have jobs for the future. What are some of those, the major differences in either the training needed, the maintenance operations, the safety aspects, they're kind of the, the big key points of that? Well, the, the safety aspects is that you're dealing with high voltage electricity. Um, uh, the, the motors that run these things run on 600 volts DC. 600 volts DC will kill you very quickly, very dead. And so all the safety precautions that you, you, know, you wear rubber boots so that you're not grounded. Um, we have um, rubber coats that are like uh, personal protective equipment that you work, that you use when you're working on the batteries. Um, you, you need to make sure that various things are grounded or not grounded. You have to make sure that various batteries or capacitors or other electronic equipment is drained before you work on it. Um, it's a matter of safety and not being stupid. 
doing things one step at a time. Um, you know, diesel engine exhaust is about 700 degrees. So if you're playing around a diesel exhaust manifold, um, you got to be pretty careful because that thing is really hot. Um, and it's not rocket science. You don't need a PhD like Dr. Chen. You just have to have your head screwed on right and not be stupid and not um, do things quickly without thinking. You know, that's part of it. The other thing is with all modern equipment, even modern diesel engines, um, there's a lot more computer work involved. Um, a lot of the diagnosis, which used to be done by touching things, manipulating things, using feeler gauges and all that, is now done by plugging in a laptop and you know, seeing what, what's going on in the system. That's even more so with electric, either battery electric or fuel cell electric uh, technology. Um, you, you need to have those computer skills. And there are things that you can pick up, but you just need to have them. Yeah, I, 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 to give you one simple example, if you have a uh, electric vehicle and it's on fire, you do not throw water on it. Okay. I mean, that's almost a trivial example, but you'd be surprised, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there are differences in, you know, part of this transition is where the um, various agencies like the fire department or so on are, are getting their hands around uh, these new vehicles and how they need to be treated. And they are different, and uh, there's there has to be training that um, allows them to address these kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in that kind of case, it is different because your first reaction, right, if you saw a fire, would be to, in many cases, to throw water on it. That would be a really bad mistake. You know, you're going to throw water on your Tesla. <laughs> How do you put out a fire in an electric car? What's that? How do you put out a fire in an electric vehicle? You know, I didn't ask that question. I just remembered uh, I attended a lecture and there was by a fire marshal or something and they were talking about just uh, the changes that were needed and they gave a specific example. Sure. And, and uh, at that time, I didn't ask the question, well, how did you guys actually put out that fire? <laughs> I would imagine that we have to drain it during the battle. Well, you know, you use foam. There, there, there are specific ki kinds of foam um, okay. it's, it's similar to the foam that they've got to use at airports, uh, where you have a, a, a fire with, with jet fuel, with kerosene. Mm -hmm. Um, there are various kinds of foam for small, um, for small fire extinguishers, you use CO2. Um, in some cases, you just let it burn. You, you, you drag it away or move everything away around it from things that are flammable and you just let it go. Um, if, if you have a shorted battery, um, that's pretty tricky. Um, you, you can try and keep it cool, you can try and foam it, but unless you've got some way to short out that battery, um, you really can't extinguish the, the, the fire. Now you know you're safe riding in the AC transit Electric bus or hydrogen bus? Absolutely. I mean, one, one of the interesting things you'll see about our fuel cell buses is behind the driver, there's a straw broom. Why is there a straw broom? Because hydrogen burns with a light blue. It is essentially exactly the color of the sky. And so if you have a hydrogen leak, which we've have only, we've had a major one once at one of our yards, but none of our buses has ever had a leak that caught on fire. But if you had a leak that caught on fire, you couldn't see it. If, if you look very carefully, you can see the, the, um, the shimmering from the heat, but that's why there's a straw broom because the instruction is if you think there's a fire, you take the straw broom and you stick it where you think the fire is. And if the straw broom catches on fire, you got a fire. <laughs> That's a great factoid. That's so interesting. <laughs> so I know you've got the, you have the cost per mile and you said it included maintenance. Is, um, 
and you said, you know, six parts of six moving parts is maintenance uh, more efficient on an electric vehicle, electric bus than a typical diesel because of that, because of the moving parts? Or what, what's the comparison there? Well, yes, but we, we don't have enough experience at scale. Okay. We've been doing this for 20 years. But as I told you, we started with one bus, went to three, went to 12. Um, we've now got about 40. Um, but we have a total of over 600 buses. Each of our yards has about 200 buses. Um, and so we're really, we're, we're trying to do reports and really provide learning for ourselves and the rest of the industry. But we're really on the beginning stages of learning all this stuff. Sure. We think it's gonna take significantly less maintenance, but right now it's taking in a sense, more maintenance because everybody's learning. So there's a learning curve on all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the long run, yes, I think it'll take more maintenance, fewer moving parts, simpler moving parts. But for example, um, if you look at the data, you will see that the amount of miles and time we had on the battery electric buses was much lower than the rest of them. We had problems with a few of the battery electric buses. Those problems came about because our bankrupt public utility took almost two years to bring us the power so that we could charge the buses. Oh. What happens is battery electric buses, we learned, don't like to sit. If they just sit, the the various, the, the different batteries, the different cells in the batteries become unbalanced and they don't work. So you have to always have them at least trickle charge. Well, mm -hmm. that's something we learned. We didn't know that. The, the battery manufacturer and the bus manufacturer didn't tell us that. And the bus manufacturer didn't even know. Yes. Um, when we had problems with, with these buses, we sent them back to the the bus manufacturer who pulled out the batteries and sent them back to the battery manufacturer. And so we have this whole report and analysis that gave us a significant piece of learning about how do you park a battery bus? Mm -hmm. You park a diesel bus, you park it for a year, you, you know, recharge the battery and start it up and it drives away. Not so with a battery electric bus. They, you know, there's some things you got to do with them if they're going to, if they're going to get stored for a while. So this is a pretty high learning curve for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting time though, Katie, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, people are just beginning to get their hands around this. And um, there's just, there's going to be a army of people that are going to be needed. Uh, as we roll this out, and there's going to be a lot of people that are optimizing, trying to figure it out. You know, um, I know that uh, Speaker makes these um, these uh, platforms to allow you to work on the bus tops. Mm -hmm. You know, I would encourage you guys to look at the whole infrastructure, not just the buses, but maybe the charging or other things that are necessary that will be needed as this new infrastructure rolls out. And uh, you know, it's exactly. yeah, it's a brand new space. You know, it's like the very first time you do something. It's just um, you're going to find that your old tools are not are not, you know, the best for that. And so, new tools will be needed. And uh, and there's a lot of I think um, need for people who are very creative and uh, can think of new ways of doing a lot of the pretty routine things. Because right now they're not very smooth. <laughs> <laughs> They're not right, uh, you know. And then making them and optimizing them and making them, you know, so anyone can do it. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if uh, speaker or other people can make that more routine, it'll be a big help. Lots of opportunity. Yep, absolutely. And there's really a role for your product here. You know, our diesel buses don't have anything on the roof. There's there's an exhaust up there, and that's not much. And and some of our models have air conditioning up on the roof, but most of them do not. Uh, with these zero emission buses, there's a lot of stuff up there on the roof. The, the, in all cases, 
The hydrogen tanks are up there on the roof. There's air conditioning up there on the roof. In, in some designs, the fuel cell is actually up there on the roof. Wow. Um, batteries are up on the roof. So we're spending a whole lot more time up on the roof of the bus mm -hmm. than we used to. Sure. Yep, that's definitely how we were introduced to the industry was needing that upper level access. Um, I was familiar with the HVAC system being up there, but I did not know the hydrogen tanks could also be located up there. There's a lot of experimentation. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the aspects of hydrogen is hydrogen is 14 times lighter than air. If you release hydrogen, it goes up at 40 miles an hour. <laughs> so it's pretty important that it be exposed to the air and not be trapped. I mean, one of the things that we've done in some of our hydrogen fueling stations is put a sloping roof on them so that if it goes up, it just goes off to the, the side and goes up. Um, when we convert our maintenance bays to deal with hydrogen, other than making sure the all the lighting and the electrical is all explosion proof. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do is put in the hydrogen sensors and put in fans. So if the sensors detect a hydrogen leak, the roll up doors roll up automatically, the fans start. If there's a little more hydrogen, the fans go to high. And when the fans are at high, it's hard to stand up. They are blowing air so hard that it's hard to stand up. Next stage, it calls the fire department. We've never gotten to that next stage. And in general, we don't, we don't get to the second stage. But that's, that's some of the design changes that have to be made in order to, to accommodate the problems with hydrogen. Now, if you're a shade tree mechanic and you're doing it out, outside, it's absolutely safe because it'll just go up in the air whereas gasoline forms a puddle at your feet and burns you to death. Mm. That's interesting. We, a lot of the folks we talk with are in, um, what would you call it, a legacy facility. And um, I was unaware that the facility would have to go undergo all of those updates. We just talk a lot about the space constraints um, in their facilities where they're trying to maintain the buses. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Because it sounds, as you've referenced, there's going to be a whole other package that comes with the bus for the, the charging, right? Yeah, or the charging, um, and this is an interesting point, and, and it's an interesting point if you deal with fleets. Mm. When you're doing onesies and twosies, refueling a battery electric bus is cheaper than refueling a hydrogen fuel cell bus. Okay. But when you get into large fleets, it's much cheaper to refuel hydrogen fuel cell buses than battery electric buses. We are, as I said, our yards are about 200 vehicles. We can re refuel those vehicles with hydrogen with about five pumps, four operating and, and one in reserve. Um, we can do it in the same way that we fuel diesel. Whereas if you've got to refuel or recharge a battery electric bus, you need one charger per bus, or at, at absolute best, one charger for every two buses. Mm -hmm. That's quite expensive and takes a whole lot of space. I mean, we're an urban district, so we can't spread out our yard. They're surrounded by factories and houses or whatever. So what we're gonna have to do is cover over our yards and have drop down charging from overhead. Interesting. Um, that's going to be uh, for one yard. It's going to be about sixty-seven million dollars. So wow. that's one of the big advantages of of hydrogen fuel cells. That when you begin to talk about um, fleets and fairly large yards. Um, the, the refueling is much easier and much cheaper. You might find for a smaller city, the battery electric would be more cost efficient at that, in that um, aspect than if they have- Well, and it, 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 it depends how much land you've got around um, 
your yard because you're going to have to expand your yard in order to to do the recharging. Mm -hmm. it, as the price of hydrogen comes down, it may be cheaper to, to do it that way. It may be cheaper, particularly if you've got 12 cent a kilowatt hour electricity, that's hard to beat. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's half of what it costs in California. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, is there anything we didn't ask you guys that you wanted to share? I, I think that that pretty well covers yeah. it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think you guys covered all the uh, the main questions, and uh, I think it's a great thing that you guys are doing this to uh, to educate uh, your audience about some of the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing uh, that I would just add is that this is global. People are doing this around the world right now. They're wrestling with this. So this is not any, um, you know, it's not like just one area or just for a short time. This is uh, happening in a big way around the world. And we talk and work with people around the world that are asking these exact same questions, except, you know, they may have different policies or other things, uh, but the um, but the questions are, are very similar. And one of the challenges is just like what Chris was saying, you know, if you're going to have a, a heavy duty vehicle sitting there for five hours charging. And then uh, what are you gonna do if you need that vehicle right now? Are you, you're gonna double up on your vehicles? Or, you know, and these are really important questions. Um, and um, and that's why there's a lot of research going on on how to charge faster. That's the uh, it's tremendous amount of activity right now. Uh, but these are a lot of power that you're bringing in to be able to charge faster, a lot of power. Uh, and that's going to create its own uh, costs and challenges. You know, this is um, so you're you're going to have to you're going to have to figure out how to do it. Um, and it's not obvious. This is why a study like the five by five is so important. It's an exciting time in the industry. Very exciting. It, very, very. I mean, there's a lot of work. Uh, Germany's probably ahead of all of us in doing zero emission work both with batteries and with hydrogen fuel cells. A lot of work going on in Germany, a lot of work going on in the EU. The Koreans um, are doing an, an enormous amount of work. The yeah, only people who right now have a production line class eight truck that you can buy today is Hyundai, uh, Hyundai. Um, they just sold 1600 of them to Switzerland. And believe me, to the big European manufacturers like Volvo and Mercedes and Alexander Dennis, that's pretty embarrassing that Switzerland is buying a Korean truck, um, but they are. So um, and Japan is very interested in um, both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cells. Toyota is, are really the people who believe in light duty hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, um, given the performance of batteries um, and that you can now get um, battery electric light duty vehicles, cars uh, with a 250 or 300 mile range. There are a lot of people who don't really see a place for hydrogen fuel cell light duty vehicles. Um, Toyota still strongly believes in them um, and you can, you can lease, I don't think you can buy, but you can lease light duty hydrogen fuel cell vehicles from both Toyota and Honda. They're both very nice vehicles and you can buy them from Hyundai. Um, they have a, a very, very nice sedan. Um, the, Honda, the, the Honda Clarity and the Toyota Mirai, I've, I've driven both of them. Very, very nice vehicles, probably more Mirais uh, in California than, than any other kind of light duty vehicle. Um, they're very nice because they fuel in three minutes. They, they you know, you can, you can fuel a Mirai as quickly as you can um, fuel a Ford Taurus or a, um, uh, um, a, a, you know, an ordinary gasoline fuel Toyota. So, you know, if, if you're, grandmother in Bakersfield has a heart attack and you need to drive down there, um, it's nice to be able to refuel that quickly. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's a question of quantity. 
you know, there are millions of light duty vehicles produced every year. Most of them are all, almost all of them internal combustion engines. And until you get the quantities up there, you can't get the price down. Um, there's a, there's a, a pretty strong connection between quantity of production and the ability to drop the price. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the reasons why um, light duty hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, uh, I think are gonna continue to be problematic because I don't think they're gonna get the quantities up high enough to be able to drop the price. Yeah, it's tough because uh, if you are in light duty, you need a, you know, if you think about the gas stations, the number of gas stations, you know, in order to have that kind of fuel support, um, it's very hard to do that with something that doesn't have an infrastructure already. You know, there's infrastructure for electricity, so you can actually put that in relatively inexpensive, but a hydrogen infrastructure at every, you know, at every corner, it's going to be really tough. You know, sure. that makes the heavy duty very interesting because it's the major um, cargo highways and stuff. And uh, so that, you know, that seems like a, a, a better match. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, where it's starting is in fleets. Um, bus districts are, are obvious. We all fuel our own vehicles, whether it's diesel or, CN or compressed natural gas or liquid natural gas or hydrogen, whatever it is. They all come home to a yard at night and get fuel. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing some interest in um, both battery electric and but mainly hydrogen fuel cell electric for drayage trucks, the trucks that take cargo from ports to the warehouses, where it's then either transshipped onto trains or whatever. Again, they're vehicles that, that come home at night. Mm -hmm. um, Nicola talked about a nationwide set um, of hydrogen fueling places. I think that was pretty optimistic. I mean, before long distance trucking goes to hydrogen fuel cells, there's going to have to be the infrastructure to support them. And I don't see that happening in the short term. Longer term, it seems to me that, that hydrogen fuel cells are really the way to go for long distance trucking. And somehow, whether it's through government action or through private investment or whatever, um, we're going to have to get a pretty nationwide set of fueling infrastructure for that. Because I think, as you know, the way that trucking works is somebody takes a load from the port of Oakland to Chicago, and then they call up their cargo broker and say, hey, Joe, have you got another load for me? And he says, yeah, I've got something that's going to Mobile, Alabama. And you say, great, you know, I'll drive to wherever it is, hook up the, the trailer load of whatever is going to Mobile. But you don't get to choose where you're going. And so unless it's, I mean, for example, Budweiser is doing some experimental work with both battery electric beer trucks and uh, hydrogen fuel cell truck. But they're going from the brewery to their distributors. So if you've got fueling at both of those, you're, you're golden. Mm -hmm. um, and they're only going back and forth. They've got Teamster labor um, and, and that can work. Spreading it out for around the whole country is gonna take a decision to how do we create the infrastructure to fuel these trucks around the country. Awesome. Well, um, I very much appreciate your guys' time, all the information you're sharing. Can't wait to see what comes out of the next round of the data you've gathered. Um, just very much appreciate you taking the time to share with us this afternoon. Pleasure, and thank you for putting this together. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, Katie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys.